Live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and I am live with you today. And I have, I got to get this guy in the camera here. Where can I put the camera? Let's see if we put it there. Maybe that'll work. See if we can aim it in that direction there. Hold on, everybody. There we go. Pastor Reg Kelly is in the house today. He has brought a box of books that look like this. If you have not got a copy of this book yet, I want to tell you, it is absolutely phenomenal. The stories that he's been telling me um, about the about the, uh, the the people that are wanting this book. Uh, we both have a pastor friend out in Harrison, Arkansas. I go to his camp meeting every year, Pastor Lonnie Burtz. And um, this story centers around the area that Pastor Burks lives in northwest Arkansas, that area there. And um, he has taken how many books so far? About a bunch of them. A bunch, a bunch of them. It's just going like crazy. So uh, Brother Kelly is in the area preaching a revival uh, this week. And um, he offered to come up. And uh, take our girls out to lunch because they helped put this thing together and make it what it is. And uh, so we just came back from lunch. That's why we were late getting started today. But when he told me he was going to be in the area, I thought, well, I'm going to have you on. And we're going to promote this book. And uh, it is it's when he sat down and and shared with us what this book was about and the storyline that uh, it was it was telling and the issues that it deals with uh, we were just we were stu I was stunned uh, it was me and I'd had my daughters I had Christina I had Rose in the office and we were just sitting here listening to him he had this this big box full of this hand drawn you know they make typewriters now don't you Somebody told me that they're making time. Typewriters. typewriters and computers you can write stuff on. But he, he wrote this thing out mostly by hand. And he brought the rough manuscript up to us and then sat down with us and was sharing with us the story uh, and the storyline behind this book and the, and the number of significant issues that it deals with, issues that... Uh, I know are dear to me, and I know they are dear to him. Uh, you're dealing with issues related to the American family and the breakdown of our families, the breakdown of our culture uh, since, what do you the, the 1960s? 19, i tell you my little theory, 1963. 1963, you had uh, the Beatles flying over. The British invasion, they called it. You had also in 1963 a, a papal transition. Pope John 23 that died and Pope Paul came into succession. Now, there was a book written by a Jesuit priest. Malachi Martin wrote a book called Windswept House. He wrote it similar to the way Walk the Sea with Me is written. He wrote it in a fictitious setting, but when they interviewed him, after this book came out about was it really fiction, he said it's set in a fictitious style, but the information in it is absolutely true. And I'll tell you what he what he in the very front of this book, The Windswept House, he detailed a ritual that he said he had personal knowledge of that took place in the Vatican in 1963. A ritual, a ceremony was done in collaboration with St. Paul's Cathedral in the Vatican 
and a Roman Catholic church in Charleston, South Carolina. And I won't give all the details because it's very it's a very horrific ritual. But he titles it in this book, The Enthronement Ceremony of the Fallen Angel Lucifer, taking place amongst high-ranking Vatican officials. Many of them are P2 Freemasons. And you have the Catholic Church on one hand saying, we are against Freemasonry. But then it is known that in the high levels of the Vatican, the Italian Freemasonic Lodge, the P2, has members who are cardinals in the Vatican. I don't doubt it one bit. I have no disagreement with that whatsoever. But he said that ritual took place, 1963. You have the assassination of JFK in 1963. And if you look at American culture before 1963, the, the Leave it to Beaver culture, before 63, and then after 63, after the Beatles, after that British invasion, after Elvis, after there was a transformation in our nation because just six years later, you have Woodstock. Woodstock would have never taken place in 1959. It would have been outlawed. Police would have come in and invaded the whole thing and arrested everybody. But by 1969 now, you have such a significant transformation in the American culture. It's almost like, well, it is. There's no doubt in my mind that a spirit has taken over in this country. And he talks of that cultural transformation uh, in this book. He deals with the sad condition of many American churches in this book. He deals with the Bible translation issue, am I right, in this book. Uh, and the list goes on of things that, uh, issues that you and I have been, we have grieved over. It has caused us to pull back from this world, and rightfully so. We homeschool our children now instead of sending them to the public schools because you can't trust them anymore. And we can't go to, the, you found that these, you cannot find a church in your area that still sings out of the hymn book, that still preaches out of a King James Bible. You cannot find a church within a 100 miles of your house, and many of you have no idea what to do because you feel guilty not going to church, but then you decide, I'm not going to that church. I'm not going to have my children sit and listen to the garbage that's coming out of there. And so, and the list goes on of the number of religious and cultural uh, issues that you and I are, that they're very dear to our heart. And Pastor Kelly has tapped in to those issues and has drawn out this, I, I, I was amazed when I saw the book. I mean, I, I knew roughly how much work was being put into it uh, by the girls downstairs. They were typing, and he was actually spent a week here writing and finishing up the book while they were typing the book. But I was amazed to see that it ended up being uh, this big. Pastor Kelly, it's good to have you... Um, with us on today's live program, let me let me start by um, asking you, what was it that first? Where did this book come from? What what was it that first inspired? Because I've known you for years, I've known you as a preacher, I've known you as a, a cattleman, a dairyman, a cattle auctioner, I've known you as a lot of things. But when you called me and told me that you had a a novel that you were writing, and I'm going, what is he thinking? Where did this thing come from? How did this thing start with you? Well, let me just say, first of all, Mike, it's, it's a joy to be here with you, and um, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being on this. The, am I speaking loud enough? Cause gotcha. I, can't I got tell. you taken care of. All right. Um, and in reference to what you said a while ago, and I'll, I'll move into the answer to that question, but Everything you were saying a while ago is prophetic. Jeremiah chapter 4 talks about the lion has come out of his thicket. The lion came out of his thicket there, just like you said, in, in, the, in the early 1960s. Right. And the thicket of the uh, European 
uh, not just European, but your your third world countries, the music and the spirit of those things came across with the Beatles there in 1964. I've, I've always said this, the culture shift changed. I believe God lifted his hand when America elected its first Catholic president. Now, I, yeah. lo- I love Catholic people. I want them to be saved. I, my, I'm, my, my last name's Kelly, and my mom's side was Rhodes, and there's Catholic on both sides, German and Irish. But I'm thankful for the people that preach the gospel in this country. But when we told God the very thing that our ancestors fled from with that popish Dark Ages stuff in Europe, right? and then, like you say, immediately the next year, the Beatles came, and then from there, the Vietnam War situation. So the book in itself, what it does, it launches out of this line. The line has come out of his ticket prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 4. And the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. That's what the Bible said. And so what we saw was the destruction of, of our educational systems, the destruction of our churches, the destruction of our families and homes, and, of course, and the barriers against the sodomy and the, the, the worldly influence. But as far as where the book came from, uh, people need to understand that uh, I'm not a young guy anymore. I don't feel old, but I'm not young. I was born in 53, and in 63, when all this started happening, I was a 10-year-old boy who would listen to the radio and the rock music and the milk barn right. while we milked. And uh, I was watching all this occur, and, of course, then became a teenager there uh, in the late 60s. And so I saw uh, the rock culture come in. That was a big issue that, that brought all this about. And then you come through your uh, Vietnam War, which was a sea change situation. And again, you talk about your Woodstock era, which was combining to that rebellion and the idea that America was not, you know, the, a total rejection of the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage of America. So when you come up through that and then you get into your assassination of Martin Luther King, of course, Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and all that. And uh, and so that's where this thing launches out of and seeing the breakdown in the cultural deal. Now, there's something I want to say that I really tap into here, and that is what I call the playboy culture. Right. Hugh Hefner in the late 50s, of course, if you go back and study Marilyn Monroe, and I do even mention her somewhat in that book uh, with one of the characters. Uh, the Playboy culture said something to American men. Now, don't get me wrong. Man has been a sinner since the Garden of Eden, right? But in sixty three, in, in the late fifties and sixties, what happened was what what we call I would call the Playboy culture. And what it said was this: Men, you can leave your, your the Judeo Christian biblical uh, role of manhood, and you can become wolves. Right. And so, uh, all of a sudden, all the college dorms had naked uh, centerfolds. Uh, tacked up on the walls of the men's rooms and all the dormitories of America, and the floodgate was opened. And here's and this Me Too movement, and what you've seen just last week with Judge Kavanaugh, all this is an outworking of what was happening back then. And that's why, if I can, I'm going to be writing sequels and bring this thing all the way through. But it opened up the Playboy culture, and what it said was that men can have responsibility, have pleasure without responsibility, and we can instead of loving our wives, instead of respecting women. Instead of honoring women, instead of providing for them and being what the, the biblical role, all of a sudden we are wolves and we are predators right. instead of protectors. Let me let me add something in here uh, along with that. When these men, these grown adult men, were buying these magazines, mm-hmm. they were taking them home, mm-hmm. and their boys and their daughters exactly. were finding these magazines in daddy's drawer exactly. under daddy's bed right. or in daddy's briefcase or whatever and it was all of a sudden now the devil was reaching into the childhood the innocent childhood of america go ahead okay now exactly so and, and the, so the seeds are being sown but but here's where i'm going with and the, you to, to understand this book because this book will take you on a journey of understanding this me too movement that we have now and the and the full circle this what i call a cycle of immorality so men begin to treat women, and here was the deal. Here's the, and you'll read this in the book, basically, but in the storyline. But a guy in my culture, as a 16, 18, 22-year-old boy, the whole deal is you were not a man, Mike, unless you were out honking women all the time, right? seeing how many women you could get in bed with. And you know what the guy could do? The guy, he could get the girl pregnant. He walks off, goes shoot pool, ch- race his car, go to the races, go to the ball games, and he's the dude. He's the stud. But what's wrong with the girl? What happened to the girl? Well, she's pregnant. Now, remember, this is before uh, before 73. She's pregnant, and so she has to bear the child. She births the child. She's 
responsible. What happened was the man had pleasure without responsibility, but the woman couldn't have pleasure without responsibility. Right. Now you get about five or six years of that, and that is what brought Roe versus Wade to the fore. Because women said, if you men are just going to have pleasure with responsibility and abdicate your biblical manhood role, we women are not going to accept this. Right. So what was the way out? Abortion. Legalization of Roe versus Wade. So the woman, she has her pleasure. She gets pregnant. Then she can fix it by having the baby aborted. But, of course, the problem is that was murder. But the men went along with it because then the men didn't have to say, oh, I have a bastard child over there in another town right? or down the street here or wh whatever. And so the men were for it, too. And so then you come, and then what happened was the floodgates of immorality were uh, unbridled lust. And then you move through the 70s into your early 80s, and by that time, the men, they weren't sad. At, there was two, two aspects of lesbianism and sodomite. The men get burned out lust. Natural affection does not satisfy them anymore. Right. So they moved on to further vile and perversion, perverted acts. The women, now listen to me carefully, those of you listening. The women became burned out of men because they had been abused and violated by men, whether it was by rape or date rape or, or you, know, you know, a gal gets in a car with a guy or in the wrong place with a guy and he keeps pushing her. Right. Okay. And his basic deal is, well, why did you come in this far with me and you're going to stop now? All right? So the gal, and then what happens is, as with the pornography industry came, more and more vile acts occurred. And then what happens is men want these women to cooperate with them in vile acts. And the women are saying, there's no romance here. There's no love here. I'm, an, I'm a sex object. And so the women begin to move away from natural affection. This is Romans chapter 1. So then you start moving to your lesbian movement and, and all of that. Now, as far as how this book came about, this book's been in my mind for probably 20 to 25 years. And I just wanted to write a story that pulled back the curtain. The book is not vile. It doesn't record any vile scenes, but it is very tough and very edgy. But I wanted to record what was going on behind the smile behind the church scenes behind the right. what you see when you go into church and what you see when you meet somebody because as you mike i've pastored now for 36 years right. grew up in this and and i visited this morning probably an hour and a half with a pastor who's dealing with a marriage situation and mike all of this perversion burned out garbage people wonder why marriages can't be fixed mike there's two we're in a sodom and gomorrah culture uh, people are being used and women are tired of being so by the way in this me too movement now it's come it's full circle now the women are saying you know what if you're going to treat us like trash and you're not going to be biblical men right. then uh, then we're going to hold you accountable for your conduct and for your actions and of course everything as it left the biblical foundation in this country uh, the gate was open to anything and that's where we're at but as far as the book goes i've had it in my mind for probably 20 25 years and um I wanted to write a story that I felt reflected several issues and several layers of area in life and, and put a realness to it. How did, how, the, the things that you spoke of, I was thinking of in Genesis chapter 3 where God, concerning Eve, he put the desire of her heart would be to her husband, would be that she would to be look up to her husband that she would, and this is what I learned in 30 years of marriage, and I learned it probably later than I should have, but I'm glad I learned it when I did, was that my wife was not my, my equal as far as how we think is concerned, and she was looking for, in me, she was looking for a man to be a man and to look up to this man and to regard her husband and to honor her husband. And I had to be somebody worth honoring. I had to be somebody worth respecting. Right. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't think that way when we got married. It came years later when God really began to deal with me. I am a product of I'm a little bit longer, younger than you are. I'm a product of the 70s. I wasn't born until 66. So my in my lifetime, the sexual revolution has already occurred. Right. right. And I'm, I'm now the recipient of the garbage and the trash that has been laying around all this time. 
And so God began to deal with me later on in life about being a godly husband and being, Mike, if you want her to love you, if you want her to look up to you, you got to be somebody worth loving, somebody worth respecting. And that's something that God had to instill in me. I didn't learn it in public school. Yeah. Didn't learn it from television, watching television. No, no, didn't learn it on Sesame Street. I had to learn it in many ways the hard way from the Word of God. But at a time before my lifetime, these things were instilled in young people at an early age from the home, from the school, from the local church. Yeah. But now all of that has been taken away from these children now. And that revolution is... So how did you... What what did you how did you write that into this book? In other words, you could have written just a documentary on the American culture. It probably would have read like a documentary, but you decided or God decided for you to lay this in your heart in a story type manner so that people could when people read these characters, they immediately are going to gravitate to various of those they're going to understand I know somebody like that right so what led you how did you write how did you weave that into this story? I wish I could say that I knew I'm not going to say here and try to talk something I, I after the book was published and I went back and read it objectively yeah. from an outside, I literally said, how on earth did I write this yeah, but I will say this to you that even in my preaching through the years, you know, as 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 preachers, even as Christians, we need to minister to the heart and right. to the spirit of people. So I knew, number one, I did not want to write. I had no interest in writing just another Christian novel. Right. I wanted to write something that would move deeply into the heart when to the person who is behind the door of their of their soul that's weeping, that's hurting, that's in pain, that, that has suffered from these from this cultural shift away from uh, Judeo-Christian heritage and who is suffering. And so when I began to develop the characters, uh, the girl, Carla Childers, that is the center character of this book, I just somehow or another, I, I just asked the Lord to help me to enter into her heart, into her mind, how she was thinking. Right. But I have been around. Mm -hmm. I have dealt with people. Right. And, you know, um, I, I just drew from my life experiences and of the people that I've known and what I've seen happen. And one of the things that I did try to do was take from the innocence that God puts in us as children. And as that innocence moves into, uh, you know, the adolescence age and, and as they begin to really get hit with the world. And there's a, you know, there's this there's this shift from the, the time of innocence to the time of making a decision whether to become involved in evil and sin or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just but I wanted it real. I, that's all I can tell you is about these characters. And there's you know, many of them, but I wanted them real. I wanted to bear their hearts and create scenes in the story and a storyline where, you know, it was real. That if I was, would say anything, all I wanted, I said, God, I want this story to be real. I don't want, I, I don't need no junk. Yeah. And I want people to read it. And number one, I wanted to say, to be able to say, you know what, this, this is the way things is. This is the way things really are. And secondly, and most importantly, that even through all that, God's grace is always greater than all of our sin. Amen. And that's one of the I'm not. I don't just write this book to, to give a storyline of historical events and so forth. It's historical events but, events, but I wanted it through the eyes of the people who experienced that time, how it affected their lives, the spiritual warfare that they had, the stupidity of people, <laughs> you know, and, and, the, and the cruelty and the meanness of people. And uh, and I wrote it from my life's perspective, and uh, and although it's a historical fiction, uh, there are many of the scenes that, in some way or another, through my life, I have dealt with this either personally or with people that I've known. So Carla Childers is the main character yes. in this story. Tell us a little bit about Carla. What what how she comes into the book? What happens to her and so on? Tell a little bit about her life. Without giving away sure. the end of the book or yeah. the the, the one, end of it, tell us about one her. thing. I would tell people when you get the book, read the prologue very carefully. There's a three part prologue. There's a map. What I'm impressed with was, <laughs> and and you showed me this. There was a map. Yeah. Of the uh, what area is this? That's Newton County, Buffalo River County. This is real. This yeah. is a real place. Now, yeah. when he showed me that, I said, Reg, where'd you get that idea? Because 
I, I've seen some pretty good novels, and they include maps like this. I told you about J.R. Tolkien when he wrote the Lord of the Rings series and The Hobbit. In, I can't remember which one of those, he included, he made a map of Middle Earth, which is a made up place, but he made a map of this place and wrote in all of the different locations that he put into the storyline so the reader would have a visual image of where this, where each aspect of this story takes place. And that's what you've done here is that you've included a map of this area so that, you know, if you've never been to Newton County, then you could look at this and know then exactly what he's talking about. But you'll have to get the image if you've never, if you have never been to the Ozarks, <laughs> Southern Missouri, Northern Arkansas, you have not seen Middle America as far as I'm concerned because no. it is a place. It is a. It's a beautiful and the Ozarks actually stretches up into Jefferson County somewhat. Paul Harvey. Yeah. Paul Harvey has, or he had before he died, he had a place that he lived over here in Kimswick, Missouri. It's right along, it's over on a bluff over the Mississippi River. He called it his home in the Ozarks. And I'm going, mm. it's at the very edge of the Ozarks, but it's, <laughs> no. I guess you'd call it the Ozarks. Yeah. But if you've never seen the the American Ozarks, you this is a place all of its own. It is absolutely stunning. It is beautiful. It has resources beyond belief. This land literally was a for those pilgrims who came over here a land flowing with milk and yeah. honey. It's so biblical. It had the springs flowing out of the hills, it like did. the Bible talks about. It, you it, know, go ahead. Uh, you, there's two or three things I'd like to say in response to your question, and I again appreciate your your thoughts and questions because I'm, it's too much for me. My mind can't grab hold of everything <laughs> I'm wanting to say. But I, I, remind me to come back to Carla in okay. just a little bit. But one of the big issues is this, and I'm, I want to show you how th things tie in here. In 1973, see, the, the Buffalo River was made a national, the first national river, that first national river by Congress in 1972. Right. And why? Why did they okay. do that? It was a, um, the environmentalist movement was in its stages of uh, the song this land is your land this right. land is my land that's a social written by a socialist yeah and their idea was that you know some of them with good intentions was that we need to preserve national treasures but what the story hasn't been told is what they did to the people who own the land any of you listening to me would not like it tonight if the government opened up your backyard to campers right and uh, and and people just to come and live and basically what they did congress did and it was through the funds of uh, the Sierra Club and your environmentalist groups, they pumped the money in, basically just bought the Congress people off. And, 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 uh, they got, there was a doctor out of Fayetteville, Dr. Compton, who got a Supreme Court judge to come down there, float the river, and he just got all these bigwigs on the bandwagon. And they're, and they were liars. And I'm going to say why they're liars. And there'll be people disagree with me on that. It's, you, you have that right. But they claim that they were protecting the river from the dams. Okay. There was a time early in the century when they were, but that had been cut off. It was stopped. It weren't going to happen. But they used that to act like they were protecting the river and even the people of Newton County from the terrible dam people that want to turn it into a lake. Well, that, that wasn't going to happen. Right. The people in Newton County voted 95% to 5% in 1969 not for this to happen. They didn't pay attention to it. Right. And they came in and basically took their land away from them. Who are they trying to take? Who are they trying okay. to protect the land from? Yeah. People. Yeah. Humans. Exactly. And uh, so anyway, it's just like it is now. It's a socialist movement right. to do away with private ownership and to socialize the whole country, in which in its bottom line is communism because they want all land to be. Com and, and you can see how far we've moved from 1972 to now where your socialists are openly saying they're socialists, openly saying they want to uh, take away private ownership, want nationalism. Obama, in his book, I mean, his father, in his his his, uh, his thesis that he wrote, won nationalization of all land and all industry. That's Obama's dad. Right. So, but anyway, let's go back to Carla Childers here, because I do weave in this, this issue of socialization, taking away of private property uh, for public use. Now, um... Carla Childers, uh, and her, if, I'll just say this to it. Her daddy was, uh, I bring the Vietnam War into this thing. Her dad was uh, killed in Vietnam in 1965, one of the first casualties. Uh, I actually have the actual place mentioned in there where the first casualties happened in Vietnam. Uh, her 
Daddy's request was for that she be raised in the country back in the you know in the homeland area. Mm-hmm. So her mother moves her back there, buys a store, and uh, she is living with her mother in the back of the store uh, down there in, in uh, Newton County. And uh, she'd been raised by her mother according to the wishes of her deceased father uh, for that. And she is uh, conf- being confronted now. She's a junior when this book takes in. And what's happening, you'll find it real quick. Now, I'm not going to get into the first chapter, but now the first chapter gets tough quick. It opens up with her on her horse in on, out in the uh, Buffalo River. But quickly in the chapter, it turns to a school classroom and a teacher that came in from Massachusetts. And the game is on. Yeah. And she is being challenged at this point in her life about every belief that she has. Uh, creation. Abortion, you know, evolution, church, constitution, patriotism. Every vestige of her soul is being challenged by these teachers that would come in from these out. And by the way, I experienced this in my own hometown of Norwood, Missouri. Yeah. You know, you have a teacher comes in and they're on a crusade and they're going to and and they mock and belittle uh, Judeo-Christian heritage. And they think it's their their uh, goal in life is to convert these kids in their classrooms yep. away from the simple childlike faith in Jesus yep. Christ and the word of God. And so they start tearing things down little by little by little. And so what you see as you go into the book is a battle between what she has grown up to believe and what she's now being taught in the classroom. And here's the thing that, that I really try to pump in here. You know, each one of us, we're confronted the same way. Mm-hmm. We have God's word on one side and we have the world's way on the other side. We have to make a decision. Right. Who are we going to believe? But we have a problem. We have a flesh nature. And that flesh nature is very <laughs> prone. I mean, it's prone to sin, period. Yeah. So it's easy to pull these young people into sin and into believing things that will allow them to, to go out and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and, uh, and which begins the destruction of their, their life. But Carla is um, just a picture of an average young lady now, I'm going to say this right now, and I'll hopefully say it again. Those of you listening, you know, there's a lot of fun in this book. I don't want you to think this is some big preacher. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a guy who enjoys life, and I wove into this the enjoyment of life. There's deer hunting in here. There's canoeing in here. All right. There's everything in this book, okay? There's church services, I, I, and I show the hypocrisy in churches. I show, you know, there's there's funny stuff in it. You'll laugh, but you'll cry. But I'm telling you. Through it all, in my life, God, even through my sin and my failure and everything that I've met, God's grace has been sufficient. And, and that's the thing I want you to get a hold of. But um, she's, she's a picture of millions of young people in America who are confronted with the cultural change that occurred and, 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 and how she deals with it and how she responds to it and uh, how God takes her through it. Amen. Who is the, who is the main... So we have Carla Childers as the heroine, mm-hmm. the female hero okay. of the story. Who is the main antagonist? Who is the evil, <laughs> lurking, wicked Jezebel or whoever, <laughs> Satan ter- character in the book? Well, this, there's not particularly I, – I've done it in this way. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, so Satan's always behind all that stuff. But there are some characters uh, – uh, one of the school teachers uh, that she is dealing with is kind of the uh, Satan's agent to start with that she's having to deal with very hard through part of the book. But there's a wonderful ending to that. I won't go into all that. Uh, the scene does move, and I want to I want to bring something up. How many out, how many out there has heard of Grapes of Wrath? Yeah, yeah, John okay. Steinbeck. All right, Grapes I've, of Wrath. I've read the novel and I watched the movie. Yeah. And that yeah. was a that was a cultural. Sea change book. Sure, it was. It's almost forced reading in colleges, yeah, high schools. I take something from, and here's what's funny. I've never read the book. I started mm-hmm. reading it, got in about two pages in, and too much cussing for me. Yeah, okay? it's it's it's, f- it's filthy. It is very vulgar. I did watch the movie. Uh, I think it's Peter Fonda. Was, did, Peter, yeah, Peter uh, Fonda. Uh, the movie. Yeah, Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda. Yeah, yeah. Henry Fonda. Yeah. And I did watch the movie. They didn't have all the no, much vulgarity didn't. in it. But I took something from that because. In the prologue and in the story, you have to get the setting in history. I have a family who leaves during the Depression in 1932, who leaves Newton County and goes to California to the gold rush. Okay, you know, everybody was leaving. Money, everybody was broke. It's, it's the Grapes of Wrath situation. Right. 
they go out to California. They do very well. And, uh, and I tie these two cultures together. But they're tied by the fact that that family in California originally was in Newton County, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Those Some of those family members become some of the villains because they represent those who believe opposite of biblical, who have left their biblical heritage, who have been totally embraced, who have traded God for mammon. Right. And that's what really happens. But even out of that family, there's a person who comes. I, I'm gonna, I can't give too much away here. I, I, well, I, there's some things. That I'm writing some notes here. And there's some things that I know that are in the book <laughs> okay. that I'm going to make you say it, okay? Cause, <laughs> because I think in, or, it, th this could either be a book that somebody would get they, that would sit on their shelf that they would never touch it, but it's not that book. This book, when you sat down in my office and you reeled through this thing, I was... I was stunned, not not offended, but I was, in a way, I was grateful and I was thankful that you had incorporated some pretty scary things into this storyline. Some things that, well, I can tell you, the first, you know the story, the first time I heard you preach in, in 2000, 18 years ago, was at Oak Lane Church, and I sat there with my arms crossed like that, and I'm going, he can't say things like that. That ain't right. He's too mean. <laughs> and my wife jabbed me an hour into that sermon, jabbed me and said, how come you don't preach like that? And boy, I was furious. <laughs> but that message, God showed me, Mike, I called you just like I called John the Baptist just like I called Jeremiah, just like I called Ezekiel. I called you just like I called Moses. I called you to say things that certain people don't want said. I called you like I did Ezekiel. When I told Ezekiel, you're, gonna, you're, you're speaking the same language as they are, but they're probably not going to listen to you, and they're going to hate your guts. And I had to overcome in me the fear of, I want everybody to like me. Mm -hmm. And if I I learned from you that I have to God calls us to say certain things and to deal with certain issues that now most pastors won't touch. They won't touch race relations. They won't touch divorce issues. They won't touch problems that are in our schools. They won't touch uh, issues of what we call shacking up now because most people are doing that. They won't touch these issues. They try to give people this generic Jesus with a generic gospel that really is all it's for is to make you feel happy about yourself. And then you're going to, they tell you you're going to go to heaven for no good reason. But they're not going to try to deal with any of the issues that God, God needs to plow up areas in our life, rough areas in our life. Things that, that my generation has been ingrained in by the social liberal agenda, those things have got, that's fallow ground that's got to be plowed up by the word of God so that the seed can go in and, and work in, in my life. And you were saying things that night that in my mind I thought that couldn't be said, that it was just mean spirited, but it wasn't mean. It was real. It was things that ha has been people we've been silent about for too long. And there has to be somebody to step up and say, this is wrong. This is going on in our schools. This is going on in our homes. This is going on in our churches. And none of it's right. And so you deal with, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list off some of the things I know, and I'm going to hopefully try to just goad this stuff out of you. <laughs> you deal with suicide. Right. In one particular part of this book, in one night, how many suicides take place? Uh, three. Three suicides. In now, we just found out there's a high school, DeSoto High School here. Three suicides in that school in two weeks' time. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Okay, it's yep. got, 
it's got it's got to be talked about. It's got to be dealt with. And and I've listen. I've attended funerals of teenagers who committed suicide only to hear the minister say, "Well, they're in a better place now. They're in heaven now." Mm-hmm. And I want to jump up and say, "You're lying to these people. You're sending them to hell." Mm-hmm. Because every one of these people is going to think they can put a gun in their mouth yep. and go instantly to heaven yep. because they're a good person. And it's got to stop. And so in, 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 three, in two weeks' time at this school, three young lives snuffed out. Now, I read my sister sent me the obituary of one of these teen girls. And it read, I'll probably pull it up, I'll get it wrong, but it read that Number one, she's classified in all capital letters as a feminist. Big letters. That mm-hmm. was on her obituary. Well, she is a feminist. Mm-hmm. And um, I can't let's see. I'm going to pull up what else it said about her because it, it's just I, what it just makes sense. Yeah, here's this young. I'm not going to give her name out, but she's uh, she calls herself a feminist that stood for everything she believed in. She was an artist, singer, writer. She enjoyed animals, nature, hiking, visiting art museums, actress, so on and so on. She loved Marvel comic book movies, Stephen King novels, novels, and Harry Potter. Yeah, boy. So what is she fed? <clears throat> Here's what she's fed her mind with. Fantasy superheroes. Stephen King is one of the most horrific writers. He's, he's As far as writers, he's the most prolific horror writer, I think, ever. Because he just keeps pumping them out. He just keeps getting new ideas of ways that people are tapping into the occult realm. And then you had the Harry Potter series. This is who this girl was. She never read the Bible. Had she read the Bible, there may have been hope that she would not have ended her life at 17 years of age. But how, how true, what I've just read to you here, how true does that resonate in this book? Well, it's absolutely truth. What the contrast is, is the contrast between a culture of life and a culture of death. Jesus Christ said he came to give life and life more abundantly. Uh, Satan is a murderer. And yeah. I did not feel that I could write this book and be real without dealing with this issue. And I know that this is a delicate, sensitive issue. And there are certainly many issues to take in consideration because one of the things the big things about suicide that i i i grew up and i read you know <clears throat> when i was growing up you committed suicide you busted hell wide open because yeah. you were a murderer murder is murder self-murder and also when i began to study the scripture on it uh there were men in the bible who wanted to die but and but you read him and the only one that did and it, it, that I know of is Samson when he pulled the pallet pillars in on himself, but he was killing the enemy as he went. It was an okay. act of war. It was an act of war. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, I again say this: if if there was any remote possibility that committing suicide, it, first of all, if you commit suicide, where was your hope? Right. Where was your life? Right. Christ is our hope. Right. Committing suicide is the ultimate act, act of despair, and despair is when you have given upon God, you have no hope in God whatsoever. Exactly. So the whole thing is, is, but we've believed a lie. But I would say this to us, that even the only thing that I've ever seen that concerns me is sometimes we're in this opioid and all this drug deal. I knew I have known people who got on painkillers and stuff who literally got outside their own mind, and, and I know that it was a result of that. But, right. but again, I want if I'm going to make a mistake, I want a mistake err on the side of telling a child listen you kill yourself you're going straight to hell because who knows what that life could have been god is not the author of death he's the author of life and i'm not the judge about everything but in this story i make it clearer that you know they went to hell sure and the as far as the issue of suicide goes uh these kids need hope yeah they, do. they don't need to be told they can kill themselves right and the the very fact that they're looking at that tells it is is that self evident that they have no hope in Christ. He is life, and I'm telling you, as long as God's alive, there's hope, and God's alive forever. And so there's always hope. The old timers used to say that hope springs eternal. Right. And the reason because God is eternal, and we need to get away from this culture. But I yes, I do including that. And by the way, it's a very Carla contemplates suicide. And the mm-hmm. spiritual warfare, if, if you don't read anything else in this chapter, in this book, read 
how Satan attacked her. All right. What chapter read, is that? I don't need to remember know. right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, but it's quite a ways on up in the book. Okay. But read the story where she has gotten alone, and she thinks she's pretty well out of the woods on this whole thing. But Satan comes, and he begins to give her to pump. The Bible talks about the fiery darts of the wicked. And if you and then this story goes ahead and shows how she finally realized what was happening, how she learned to put up the shield of faith to guard her from. But literally, he finally suggests to her, "You know where the gun's at." Yeah. And uh, so, it's not a fact that we won't be tempted to try it. It's that with God's grace and God's word and God's truth, yeah. we can. Let me tell you what the Bible says: Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yeah. And so, what I'm trying to do is weave in the realities that yes. We are faced with these temptations. We are faced with it. Mike, I'm going to say this over the radio station. I have been tempted with suicide. So have I. Yeah. I, I have had Satan come at me and said, yep. you ought to just end it and make yep. everybody happy. Yeah. I have been so sick and so depleted and yep. so down spiritually, physically, I emotionally. I remember that. That I, I literally, and I literally said, where'd that come from? Yeah. Because I'm a kind of guy, I'm going to live. I mean, I, me and you going to be out here? We, we, we're coming out of it. That's I mean, right. we, we got the Germans on top of us. We're in the foxhole. I'm saying, yeah. Mike, don't even think about dying. We're going to make it home. <laughs> That's the kind of guy I am. But I'm telling you, Satan is not particular about who he will tempt. No. Nope. And it's suicide is what? Number one, number two, de death reason for young people in America. Sure it is. So, yeah, I deal with it. And I deal with the hard. It's not easy. Yeah. It's, it's a tough. I, I've told people this. If you can plow through the first half of this book. Because it sets the stage for the glory of God. Amen. I mean, you know, God is so good. Amen. And he writes the last chapters and let him do it. Yeah. Don't, if somebody's listening to me out there today and you're down and you're discouraged and you think, I mean, I'm telling you, read this book. You'll learn some things because I, I weave and pump scripture into it, pump scripture into it, pump scripture into it. That these people are drawing from when they were kids. They remembered a preacher saying this, and they remembered their daddy reading this, or they remember reading this verse. And those scriptures, it's the word of God that holds you and keeps you during those times of trial and temptation. And that's my whole purpose is that we don't have to, we're not defeated. Yeah. We're victorious in Christ, you know, but we are going to go through the trial of our faith. But then basically in the story, those people who did not know the Lord, they had nothing to hang on to when it came. Right. And they sunk. I can say to you that I know that this book is unlike any other, I want to say, Christian quote-unquote novel that you've ever read. Because you know, you know Pastor Ridge, and if you don't know him, if you know me, we don't quote other Bibles except we're going to denounce them or show the fallacy of them or show what's wrong with them. So you know that if there's scripture in this book, it's going to be King James and nothing else. And that's, that's, you're not going to find that if there's, if there's any so-called Christian fiction written today, almost without fail, they'd rather pay a licensing fee to Zondervan <laughs> or some other for, for quoting NIV verses than they would to just use a King James for free. Yeah. You, you didn't have to call the queen and say, can I put your quote, <laughs> can I put your Bible in this book? It's, it's unlike any other Christian novel that you may have ever read in that when you read this, when there's scripture being given in here, you know that it's King James. Those girls, when they were typing this out, they were using, guess what? They were using the pure Bible search software <laughs> to make sure the verses were right. <laughs> Brother Mike, I got to tell you something. I was with them. Uh, we're just now starting to get back our first feedback from a lot of people that's just finished the book. Yeah. And um, I had a most amazing conversation with a lady the other day that had read it, and she uh, is not what you and I would probably call a fundamentalist type of person. Uh, but but she, she read this book, and, and just with tears in her eyes, this not even talking about which Bible to use. Yeah. This is, I was stunned. I, in a lot of the spiritual warfare scenes that, and the situations and problems and trials of life they're going through. I also draw off of old hymns. Right. And I, and I, it's like when they're going down the road and this hymn comes to their, or this verse of a hymn comes. This lady told me something. She said, Reggie, she said, um, this book, she said, I, I've never read anything like it. And she said, I realized something. She said, Reggie, at our church now, she said, they put up a deal on the wall and we sing these choruses and everybody's supposed to stand up and, 
you know, do And she said, you know, they're just shallow. And she said, I didn't realize. She said, I was reading this book. And I'm looking at what these people are going through and how the thoughts of these hymns came to their mind. Yeah. Like when peace like a river yeah. attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. And she said, Reggie, I, all of a sudden, she said, nearly in tears, I didn't realize what we were losing in our own church. Yeah. She said, we've lost the hymns. Yeah. She said, Reggie, I was reading hymns that I listened to in a, as a girl growing up. And she said, Reggie, it made me realize we're being robbed in our churches. That's our heritage. Our children are not hearing these hymns that are based upon the word of God. No. And she said, they're just these little old rippy rhymes. And she said, it made me realize that I have been robbed. That our children were robbed by going to this church where they're just singing these sing-song deals up on the screen. And we're not singing the old hymns of the faith. And she said, I was like, it's no wonder they was able to make it through because they were able to draw back on the truths of Scripture that were embedded in their minds and hearts. And the Holy Spirit was able to draw from those old hymns biblical truths that sustain them through their inner trials you know yeah. and so just just e just even the old biblical hymns is so important to get back to much less the authorized ver and by the way in case nobody knows out there i'm a straight up authorized version amen it all the way i mean the rest of it's junk you get you get you a bible king james bible and, and it, uh, it just is i was Please listening trust us on that i was listening to an interview with gerald wolf of uh greater vision uh and he does uh, he he's kind of taken on what the Gaithers did. He does hymn singings. He, mm -hmm. He'll go to churches and they'll have cameras everywhere and a bunch of people on stage and they'll sing nothing but hymns. And he said that it dawned on him that a vast majority of the population of America are baby boomers, 60 years of age and older. And he said that generation, they may not have attended a church in their adult life ever, but if they go back, one of the things they're going to gravitate to instantly yep. is when they hear the old hymns yes. that they heard when they were children. Yep. And that's why I said it's part of our heritage as Americans. You have a Bible in one hand, a hymn book in the other, and our heritage as Americans was framed and formed by what the Bible said and what we sang on Sundays. Yeah. That's ingrained in us. Yeah, the, the hymns were designed to have doctrinal truth to re sure reinforce what was preached. And, you know, it's just the way God made us. Music is a very, very, very powerful part of worship. And uh, Satan has just robbed us again. Sure but uh, I thought it was interesting that you brought the Bible part up because that lady just on her own brought out the fact. She says, I did. It made me the book made me realize how how I'd been robbed, yeah. you know, just even in the hymns mm -hmm. and stuff, so forth. But anyway. you deal with race issues mm -hmm. in this book. OK, yep. how? What what part of the story and how do you deal with you have you have a black minister in this book, right? Right. And he's he's a good guy, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, sir. He's a good guy. But tell a little bit about him and about how he is injected. He's it's in Los Angeles, right? If I, uh, if I remember right. Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield, California, okay. Yep. So tell a little bit about his character and how he he ends up meeting Carla, right? Yeah. Is it rescuing her? Almost? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, without giving the, the story away, Carla gets herself in a bad situation when she's in California. And uh, Which she should have never been in California should, should, to begin she, with. Don't go to she, California. She basically ran away from home. Yeah. And gets out there. But on the trip out there, God uh, steps in in his sovereign, you know, grace and... Uh, intervenes but she gets herself in trouble she almost gets raped by some black men she finds herself down in an area of town that's all black uh, of course she's just a white country girl and uh, and the three guys uh, almost rape her and a black preacher uh, coming down the street basically intervenes and he's not the guy you're talking about but he leads her to this elderly black man and his wife who basically okay. he's kind of a retired preacher this is a very, very important, uh, and if I write a sequel, I'm going to take their story on because this is very critical, something I wanted to do. I met a man years ago back in oh, in the 90s whose name was Reuben Fields. Uh, yeah, Reuben, I remember you talking about him. Reuben Fields is the, actually, Reuben Fields is the one who inspired me about this black man. And what Reuben Fields, one of his whole, they Uncle Tommed him. If he, I don't know if you noticed just recently, but yesterday, uh, a lot of the black rap singers, Uncle Tom, 
West. Kanye West. Kanye, Kanye West. West. They, yeah, I they, saw they, that. They, they Uncle Tom him yeah, yesterday. I'm sure they did. Uh, Reuben Fields was Uncle Tom by black preachers in Indianapolis, Indiana. And what he said was this. He said, and what I was trying to relay in this book, in the story of this part of it, is that uh, the black culture has been st- literally destroyed by the liberal progressive uh democrat party yeah uh welfare system the destruction of, you know he, brother fields told me he said reggie 80 percent of the young people on area where he pastored church that do not know who their father is yeah and he talks about how that the black families before uh, all this started you know were super strong on keeping their families together and so i bring this whole issue in uh about the deterioration from through their eyes and through their perspective what liberalism and the ungodly and the departure from the bible has done to the black culture and to the black people and to the black families and the struggle that they're having and the intimidation and the contempt and the the battle within the black uh, community itself and it's on everywhere i don't know if you watch candace owens or not do you have you no, stayed uh-uh, there? no uh, if you don't watch candace owens get over she is a young black lady who is articulating conservative values now she's oh they'll hate her guts. oh well she's and she's yeah. i mean she took literally started off doing her own little old clips on facebook so she's on facebook she's on fox news now okay and she is one of the most sharpest articulators of the destructiveness that the democrat liberals have done to the black community i mean you talk about a young gal that'll talk about fatherless children and black males not taking care of their families and if you know the whole situation there's one that will but i do yes i do address it There'll be some people won't like it. I can't help it. I don't really care. Uh, I just tell the truth as best I can see it and has has been told to me from black people. Yeah. Because there's a lot of black people that are scared to say publicly what they know to be the truth about the culture. And most white people are afraid to talk about it because they'll be we're called, called ra- racist. Yeah, we're called, they're called racist. Now, you just have to get to where you don't care. Yeah. Tell the truth. Let, let, let the Lord take care of all that stuff there. But, yes, uh, and, and, again, Weaving all that into the migration in the 30s and in the 50s of the people, even down, Brother Mike, where I live, there were just hundreds of people who left southern Missouri to go to California in the 50s during the drought and in the 30s. And in California, uh, down around Tulare, they have what's called the Missouri Gathering. And it's all people from that moved there from Missouri and the Missouri uh uh, descendants. Yeah. And they have a big festival and picnic in Missouri. People that moved. It's the Steinbeck yeah, you know, race of yeah. yeah, it's the you, you had that in the thirties and you had it again, the, and a lot of farms were lost, mm. and they just went back to the banks, and actually a lot of people don't know this, but in the fifties before that happened, my home, the t- county where I was at, Douglas County, very rural county, had more people in it in the fifties does today. Wow, there was mass exodus. Now people they all went, had to leave because of the drought. There, there was br- there was broke. I mean, there was no money, yeah. no industry, no nothing like that. And that I can remember when you talking about in the sixties. There was no jobs down where I'm at. You, everybody said, let's go to Peoria to work, go to Kansas City to work. There's no jobs down there. And so yeah. the young people left the area. And so, you know, and when you leave, whether we want to admit it or not, you go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. What did Lot do? He went down to the plains, the cities of the plains, where the money was at, where right. the rivers was at, where the markets were at. And when people, and I would just say this to us all, be careful about leaving. Yeah, You may make less money, but be careful about taking your your family to an area. Right. Well, you're going to make more money, but you're going to lose your heritage. Exactly. You're going to lose your faith. Yep. And I, I'm getting too far into the story. No, but. that's uh, you're what I what I was I mentioned I was preaching in Garfield, Arkansas, a couple of years ago, and I I've noticed this when I go preach. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I can tell you when I preach in so-called country churches, backwoods churches, hill hill people, hillbillies. Mm-hmm. You can tell a difference in them. You can tell a difference in the people. There is a general, there is a generalized respect for God and country Mm -hmm. in most country people. Yep. The city liberals don't understand that. They they call them all uneducated nitwits. They they try to defame them, but those are the people who have worked hard. They've worked hard all their. They have taught their children to work. On farms, mm-hmm. which Obama tried to do away with, if you remember back, he was going to have the, the Department of Labor guy start making these farms pay these kids or not or not let them work. Exactly, you know, that, that was stupid. It's yeah. ridiculous because you're taking away 
the heritage of these people. They're teaching their children how to work honestly and earn some, but they have an agenda. You know that. So anyway, but it's that it's that group of people that are still holding. You don't have to go and tell them you need to hang on to the King James Bible. They never let go of it like I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They never. They're not going to let go of their guns. They're not going to let go of their <laughs> land, and they're not going to let go of their Bible. Period. And they're not going to let go of their of their heritage either, where they yeah. came from. They were they were raised on that hill. They're going to stay on that hill. And right. I applaud those group of people. And you. When they get into this book, they're going to get into, just really quick, there's a chapter called Something Lost. And that chapter is about losing. And the thing that one of the main characters uh, actually becomes a boyfriend of Carla's from California recognizes is what has been lost from the time his grandmother moved out to California and Grandpa in 1932 Mm -hmm. to 1973. What has been lost as far as the work ethic right and i'm going to say something deep work ethic one of the things i'm trying to address here is the facade yeah you got a little short there we go all right you okay yeah good the facade you the facade about. that is and i want to try to be careful when i say this but there is something about a rural life that when i look at a city mm-hmm. let me tell you what i see it's cookie cut. Yeah. You you look at Hollywood, you look at the everybody's trying to be like that star. Yeah. Or be like that ball player. Mm-hmm. Or be like that somebody. Yeah. One of the things that happens in a real culture is people are more individual. Yeah. They're more accepting of how God made them to be. Yeah. Uh, they they they're not trying to be what everybody else is being all the time. And I deal with this issue, it's a very strong biblical issue of learning how to accept yourself who you are. Accept your race. Yeah. If you're black, accept it. If you're accept white, it, accept yeah. it. If you're Hispanic, accept it. If you're tall, accept it. If mm-hmm. you're short, accept it. If you're, you know, don't let the world make you determine your happiness by how you're made or who you are or how you talk or your your accent. I mean, I get called hillbilly all the time, and I'm not the one that talks funny. Everybody else <laughs> is. You know? Paul Paul talked about the First Corinthians twelve. And he said, whatever part of the body God determined you to be, be yeah, that. Exactly. Don't let, don't let the more comely parts make you think that you have no use in the body. I tell everybody, I got a little toe that's that big. It's the ugliest thing in the world. Got, and God, for some reason, put a toenail on it. I have no idea why. No, nobody ever sees my little toe. But my little toe, <laughs> when I'm ready to stand, my little toe can bear most of the weight of my body hmm. and shift the weight of my body because my inner ear has got a gyroscope in it and it tells my brain when I'm leaning or I'm fixing to fall, it's that little toe mm-hmm. that bears the weight and takes the responsibility of maintaining the stand. Yeah. And when it, and you're right. When it, these are, these are biblical issues. He's, he didn't just draw this out of his, his philosophy of what he thinks life ought to be. This comes from years of knowing what the Bible says and knowing people. And he's right. Whoever God determines you to be, be happy in that. I, I struggled with that, Reg. I, I think I, every person I, does. Everybody has. I wanted to be like this person, that person. Hey, just let's be just who be honest are, about Mike. it. If we're not careful, we want to be like some other preacher. Yeah. That was me. When God wants us to be the unique person, and I would encourage everyone listening to me, maybe you're struggling with that or you have children. Uh, I'm going to say this before we go any further. If you're listening to me today and you have a, a child or a grandchild or a friend or niece or something like that who's gotten wayward, mm-hmm. they're in a great spiritual warfare about which direction in life they're going, get them this book. Yeah. Because, you know, and, and, and don't get me wrong. Yeah, I, I want to sell the books and the book you know blah 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 and all that but i am fighting my own personal battle about wanting to sell books and yet on the other hand it being a ministry right you know because books cost it's not like a cd it's a lot more expensive and stuff but i really and honestly i mean i can say with a clear conscience that if i was a young person and i read this book and the battles that young people are going through i think it would be an immense help to me to be able to really feel and know hey i'm not the only one who is being tempted like this. I'm not the only one who has failed. I'm not the only one who has hated myself for what I've done. Right. I'm not the only one who wonders if God can forgive me. I'm not the only one 
that's been through this or that's had bad things happen to me or, you know, whatever. And it's all over the country. And to know that God's grace is sufficient, God's grace is greater than all of yeah. our sin. And if we would just turn to him in simple childlike faith and just believe, just believe what you know. Yeah. You know, just believe. I mean, you know, Jesus just says, and of course, Mike, I'll, I'll kind of carry on something else here. The name of the book is Walk the Sea with Me. And as people read this book, they're going to see that phrase come out, somebody's life, and they're going to get out of the boat. Now, Mike, whether you know this or not, you are a person who I watched get out of the boat. Yep. You were in the boat of denominational, uh, and I, I'm not against denominations, folks, per se. But if we're not careful, we're, we get in a denominational boat, okay? Right. We get in a denominational boat, and, and we get, we're not free yeah. to be with Christ because we want to make sure we, want, we feel comfortable in that boat. We're, it's in the boat of acceptance. Uh, you may be listening to me, and, and at your work, you're afraid to stand up for Christ. You don't want to get out of the boat of being liked by your friends or get out of the boat of whatever it may be. Uh, I just... Uh, Talked this week with a family that had been saved out of Mormonism. And, man, you talk about having to get out of the boat. Yeah. And everywhere in your life, God is continuously calling you like he called Peter, get out of the boat, come to me. And it's going to take some faith. But I watched you, Mike, and I'll tell you the reason you have the ministry today that you have, because you got out of the boat. It was a struggle because, like you said, I wanted, I could see myself years ago wanting these older preachers that I looked up to all my all my childhood, I wanted them now as a young preacher to accept me and then elevate me. Yeah. I wanted them their to, approval. I wanted their approval. I wanted to be able to I wanted to preach at the state meeting, mm -hmm. possibly at the national meeting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the name among those men. Boy, have you seen Mike Hargrove? Boy, he'll he'll do you good. Boy, you can. <laughs> and I wanted that. And God, I'll tell you how God did it. God used the very men that I looked up to to hurt my feelings. Okay? <laughs> they did. One one in particular just ripped me open and wounded me. And I boy, I walked away from him and I walked out of there and I thought I'll never do anything for this denomination again. And God knew what he was doing because if I was still in them, I would not speak against them and what's going on. Because I would then be rubbing shoulders with them at the next meeting, mm -hmm. and I'd be too embarrassed to, to look at them. And God knew that in order to get me to say what I had to say about them, I had to come out. God, my favorite place in the whole world was the youth camp in Niangua, Missouri, where I was saved. Mm -hmm. Nine years old, I was saved there, and I and and in my ministry, I'm going to dedicate my life to that camp. And I did for years. We went, I went down there with other preachers that I knew. Well, I worked and I did. I preached. I, I was a camp director. I did everything until they brought in a guy that he preached the entire week, never opened a Bible one time, never read a verse. Mm -hmm. And I said, are you bring, why are you bringing this guy down here? Well, he had the big name in the denomination. He had my name. So what he, he, I, he had what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I said, if that's how it's going to be, I'm not going to come back. And I, we didn't. We ended up finding Brother Lonnie and where his group of churches goes camp down in Green Forest. We we end up going down there, and I. But I had to leave that group. I had to come out of the yeah. camp. I had to be like Ruth and Mike, leave exactly. leave the Moabites. You, and I want to be careful what I say here because I actually there's no. I don't try to embed. I didn't try to embed characters, but I tried to embed the reality of of life into right. characters. But truly, Mike, there's a there's a character in this book. His name is Lincoln, and uh, he comes out of Kentucky in some odd circumstances into the Newton County area. He's a young preacher, and if if any preachers are listening to Mike and I today, and you've struggled with being in the boat of acceptance, the boat of approval, in your spirit, you want to break out. You know there's things that need to be preached. You know there's things that need to be said. You may even doctrinal issues that you know are not right but you're afraid you'll be ostracized and rejected and ruined by the denominational powers. You need to read about this young man Lincoln's story. Uh, he's a two-year Bible college dropout. And he, and he, and he, he, he tells, he tells uh, Carla 
uh, the our our main character he he tells her his story and how they how when he decided to get out of the boat how the how they crucified him and ruined his ministry and how he wound up being over in the arkansas area and he even warned her of things that she, she might hear about him yeah and he you know but he had to get out of the boat of uh, of that acceptance and but he talks about the freedom that came from it and so there's so many layers mike i mean uh, so many issues and like i say i've told people i've just woven in you know experiences of my life the experiences of people that i've dealt with that i felt were truly biblical truly right that would be helpful that would speak to people's hearts and my goal is to encourage to strengthen i mean to tell you to hey we never did play the uh Oh no! Flip. We gotta do that. Uh, the, it, the title, the title of the book is from Peter getting out of the boat, right? Yep. Am I guessing that right? It's walk the sea with me. Christ is basically saying, "Walk the sea with me." By the way, the Downing family in Oklahoma, uh, Jennifer Downing wrote the song uh, "Walk the Sea with Me" and the music to it. But you're going to show them that clip now, are you? The, hang on, hang on. I got to pull it up here. Here we go. Here we go. Um, the website, and I'll put that up on the screen here a little bit while we're speaking, a table in the wilderness dot net. Uh, let's see here. Table in the, yeah, it's not a table. It's okay. Just table, table. table. Just okay. Table. I got it. Table in the wilderness. You talk about, while I'm typing this in, you also talk about, uh, the drug culture 
and drugs in general mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in this book. Tell us a little bit about that and and what you th- your opinion. Of course, I thought you know this, but your opinion of the whole drug scene and what it's done to this country. Um. I do weave into, the fact of it is, the drug culture, uh, of course, as everybody knows, got started back there in the 60s, and the Vietnam War rebase deal started coming. One of the things that happened when, as it as it began to approach time that the Buffalo River was going to be made into a national river, it began to gain national prominence, okay? You know, your, your people who loved outdoors and you know, people like that begin to hear about it. So they started gravitating toward it. Some of the, there's some really tough scenes now that happen on the creek. You know, everybody's heard of creek parties, river parties. Yeah. Well, there's big scenes about that in this book. Of course, from the colleges across the country, you know, fads come and go. And one of the big fads was to go, take a weekend. Everybody goes down and rents canoes. And floats the river and has their beer parties and their drug parties. Oh, I hate okay. those now. I hate them. I hate floating now because you got to drive through everybody's drunken. <laughs> so anyway, you got to understand that back in that time, they were pouring into the, when this became a national deal, this became a national news story now. Big, big deal. Okay. It's the first national river in America. Keep that in mind. Right. So here's all these people coming and what are they bringing with them? Pot, marijuana, yeah. their drugs. So they're coming in. And one of the main things, and I can't tell this story because, I mean, it's a wild one, <laughs> but there is one of the saddest and most tragic things that happens as a result. And what happens was the native young people were being drawn into the drug culture, both as users and as providers. It doesn't take an old poor country boy long to learn. He can make money selling drugs. Yep. And the drug culture is a gateway to sexual immorality. Absolutely. And so I weave all of these things into this. Uh, you know, your, your liquor culture, your, your drug culture, and just, you know, I want to make some people mad. I can't preach or talk without making somebody mad. You know, we're having an issue about marijuana. Don't, please don't try to tell me about your medicinal marijuana garbage, okay? Right. Marijuana, we know, I know, you don't, don't tell me what it was. I grew up in this culture. Yeah. It is a gateway drug, number one, to, to knock out the inhibitions of morality. Absolutely. And it's a gateway to the harder drugs. Absolutely. And so, you know, if you love people, why don't you get off your medicinal marijuana deal? If you really care about people, because you know behind the scenes, your goal is you want to use it. Yep. You like what it does to you. Yep. You like how it makes you feel, and you don't want to feel guilty about using it. You want to and, say that a doctor and, and, gave it to and you. So, and, so, yeah. and so I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm with drugs and marijuana like I am liquor. Don't talk to me about that everybody I'll be able to drink a beer. Yep. Talk to me about all the people that's been killed, the children that's been beat half to death yep. by their daddy, the women that's been kicked around, and the livers that's been eat up, and the lives that's been destroyed. I am... I have no sympathy for people who think that liquor and drugs is fine. Yeah. I mean, and I do weave hard into that story because here's these college kids coming in from all over the country. And, of course, these kids in that area, they're going to be affected by it. And it's a, it's a very, very strong, strong uh, storyline. You mean you really opened up the box when you said that. Cause Bring it on. It's a, it's a strong you, – if, you, know, you may read it and not like it, but you can't say it's not true. Every one of these issues – that I preach hard against, that you preach hard against, that you've woven into this story, you now have, this is what gets me, you now have churches in America promoting. I mean, it started out years ago when these preachers thought it would be cool to have quote-unquote Bible studies at Hooters Restaurant. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows why that pastor wanted to go to Hooters Sure. And and so he could stare at those women and act like he's being spiritual with the guys. He's creating sensuality. He, absolutely. He, he's creating a bail culture. Bail, it's bailism. It's he's melding here's Bible Christianity, here's worldly sensualism and he's fusing them together like mm-hmm. they actually belong together and they don't God said come out from them and be separate. And that's that's Old Testament. They they would, yeah. they they would do that. That's what Israel did. That cord there is going to, every time you touch it, it I will not. I know there's so much, te- there's so much fire in my head. I know it. <laughs> no, as, seriously. As somebody that, who's had hey, electricity Mike. flowing through his body, I don't like to hear that sound. I can <laughs> okay. tell you that right now. Listen, Mike, this is a big area that all Bible-believing preachers need. We need to go back to the Old Testament and study the religious systems that Israel got itself into before they went into captivity. Yeah. 
And it was a combination. It wasn't that they just walked over to Baal on the hillside and start. They melted together their worship of Jehovah, their worship of the God of Israel, and they they melded it together with Baalistic worship. And they devised this system where on one hand they could say, oh, we're serving God. But on the other hand, they were indulging in their vile sensuality. Right. And then they wind up offering their children to Baal. And um, again, I'm just going to say this and do pray for those of you that are listening. Pray for me that's. If it's Lord's will that I would get this sequel wrote and, and move forward, because I want to move forward from 1974, which is the ending, the date ending of this book, right on up through the cultural sea change, especially moving into the sodomite culture that we saw in the early 80s began My and goodness. how it affected. So, you know, and, and, and we're, I mean, Mike, you and I both know we're headed toward bestiality we are. And, 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 and pedophile acceptance in this country. And it's coming, and I'm going to, this is what I'm going to bring up next in this. Dealing with the drugs, dealing with the race issues, dealing with uh, the alcoholism, dealing with suicide, dealing with all these issues. At the core of it, instead of churches preaching against these issues so that the American, the American man, the American woman has a voice to listen to, an alternative voice. He's got everybody telling him it's okay to drink, it's okay to mess around, it's okay to do these little harmless little drugs that everybody's doing. It's okay to do these things. And when he should have the voice of God's church being salt and light and giving him an alternative view to listen to, what he has now is a majority of American churches now favoring sodomites mm. sodomite marriages i told you in this county i know for i know of the influence that the the vine of sodom deuteronomy 32 the vine of sodom the fruit now is being is being shown in that you have churches who are openly accepting of sodomite marriages sodomites working in their children's church sodomites singing in the choir, up on the praise team, or whatever. Mm. Then you have you have these liberal churches that are now, they're promoting, they have promoted alcohol. It's okay to have a beer every now and then. In fact, next Sunday night after church, we're all going to go to the pastor's house. We're going to dr- pull up hey, a Mike. Bud Light, and, and that's what we're going to do. Right up here in St. Louis, you've got churches having services and bars i know they are i i have a i have a friend i can't go very deep with that. i have a friend who's who feels they're they've left out of catholicism okay they're raised in catholicism they've left that they're 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 sick of that and now they're going with some friends have got them going to a bar up here in st louis they told me and said reggie we're, we drink our beer and he preaches to us mm. and i you know and they're and they're like I'm supposed to be glad for them, and it's just you know you're glad they moved out of Catholicism. But you've addressed something here that I you're talking about various issues in this book, and so I'm assuming that most people listening to you today, you know, are Christian people who have a desire for truth and so forth, so forth. Um, in the book, you're going to find something that's very, very close to my heart and very serious to my soul, and that is the hypocrisy within churches. Yeah. And folks, let's just be honest about it. The churches have been selective and hiding. They've hid sin within yeah. the church. They've been selective about who and what was wrong. And if it wasn't what they were doing wrong, they got a pass. But if it was what somebody else did, they got crucified. Even fundamental churches. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. King James in, only in, churches. In fact, maybe more so. Yeah. Maybe more they so. They hide it. And you're going to you're going to read at least two chapters that has within it. I I will just give you this shot. When you read the book, you get to the chapter. The first one you're going to look at is called uh, the VBS, the Fountains of the Great Deep. And it's almost a funny scene. But what it does is expose the hypocrisy and the pride and the elitism that's within even little country churches. Then you're going to get to a chapter that's called Be Sure Your Sin Will Find You Out. And in that chapter, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably one of the, if the Lord brought any scene to my mind to write, it's where hypocrisy in the church gets exposed. Do you remember a song back in the 60s, maybe, um, uh, the PTA song? 
some county PTA, some no. school P, PTA meeting. Uh-uh. And the woman goes before the PTA and she's wearing mini skirts. Oh, the skirt. Harper Valley PTA. Harper Valley PTA. Valley yeah, PTA. yeah. yeah. that day the okay. mama sucked it to the Harper. Yeah, yeah got okay, it. got it. What was that song about? Why was that song so right. popular? Yeah. It was about popular because back in those days, and as well as now, right. there was a lot of hypocrisy right. going on. Big talk in the church, yeah. big surface deal, but a lot of junk going on underneath that other people didn't know. I mean, Mike, it's just like right now, preachers being immoral. Right. You know, preacher getting up preaching on Sunday, but he's watching pornography right. during the week. Yeah. And on and on it goes. And, you know, we ought to get a hold of this because God is going to expose us one of these days yeah. for who we really are. And, you know, the best thing we could do is if, if, if we've sinned, let's just confess it and get it straight yeah. and get it out and get it, get it taken care Amen. of. But to go continuously through the years and covering sin. Now, yeah. here's what happens, and here's why this is important. It is said, I don't know, just by the statistic quote, if, if, if it's right, but that 80% of children from families who attend, quote, Bible-believing churches, by the time they're 25 years old, are not in church. Right. Why? I believe that. I believe it's because of the hypocrisy they see in the churches. Sure. They'll see some old rag get up, and she talks about how spiritual she is, but she's a stinking gossip. Yeah. And I've got her in this book. Yeah. Okay, good. I've got good. her in this book. She she's so spiritual. She's able to rip everybody else in church up and everybody else. But but she's got secrets behind her life that she would die if everybody found out. This about is eighty percent of your Facebook crowd <laughs> who doesn't mind these Facebook people. They don't mind bashing everybody else's skull in about what her pet peeve is or what her what her, what she thinks everybody else is sinning about. But she's not, or she or he is not going to touch on what they're guilty of, and it makes. I don't get on Facebook anymore because I'm sick of it. I'm tired of that kind of nonsense. <laughs> well, the truth about it is that we all are hypocrites to a certain degree. Yeah. I don't think there's our flesh nature has no ability to please God. There's no, no. good in it, Mm-mm. and we're going to. And and nobody wants to drag their dirty line. And I'm not saying you should. Yeah. But what's happening is is that kids. Hey, Mike. You and I are both preachers. I'm telling you something. If my kids would be honest with you, the greatest spiritual battles that they probably had is watching their dad preach something yeah. and then fail at it. And being guilty of it. Okay? Yeah. Yep. And whether that be anger, mm-hmm. you know, you're up there, you're supposed to preach the love of Jesus, and then you get angry with your children or whatever yeah. it may be, or, or you do things that you, you preached against. And if they're not careful, they get bitter about it. And, and but here's the key: mm-hmm. if we'll if we'll humble ourselves and admit it and ask forgiveness from those we've offended, and not try to cover it. Or ju- here's where we get in trouble: we justify it, we alibi it, we rationalize it, and because it's us, or because we don't want people to dare find out that we have failures, so we cover it. Our kids know, kids in church know, and I've watched kids get so bitter at the faith because parents hypocrisy and covering their sin and they cover how do they cover it by pointing out other people's sins oh yeah oh yeah i see that all the time i've seen it i've done it years ago sure we can i've do seen it. it in i've seen it on facebook and i and it just it it gets me like you say the more sometimes the more fundamental they act exactly that's the more the more self-righteous they yes act, especially preachers that to me the more sin they're covering up either themselves or their own family. And I learned this when God started dealing with me, it was a process. It wasn't just one day right. I'm going to fix Mike Hoggard. It was a, it was a process. You know, first 1996, I became pastor here and God whooped the daylights out of me over my life. And then, you know, God, as God's called me to study prophecy, he's not yet nailed me and fixed me on the King James, but then he led me to that place to where I was ready to accept it and believe it. And then I hear this old goat preacher named Reg Kelly get up, and by the time I've listened to him three or four sermons, I'm so scared of him. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to, he's going to have everybody stand up on the King James Bible. I'm not going <laughs> to sit there. I'm going to stand up. Wait just a minute. i got to tell yeah, this. Yeah, All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey. Sorry. Folks, I'm going to tell you the reason I'm even, I'm even I, now he's getting me wound up, okay? But the reason I'm here today, 
The first time I ever met this man, Mike Hargard, he was at that meeting. And I preached, and I had no earthly idea what I was even who I was even preaching to. That's the honest truth. Yeah. I had no clue. I was just preaching like a wild man on what was it? Uh, I will not sell my vineyard. Yeah, and, and it was you about got, you got into a, almost a well, it was a verbal deal going on after that message. I remember. Oh I'm, yeah, I'm watching because <laughs> people there was there was a uh, I'm not going to say a, a, like a ministry represented there, and. I'm thinking all these guys are on the same page. They're all Mm-mm. fundamental and this, no. that, and all, you know, dress straight, look right, and don't listen to rock music, this, that, and the other. And he preaches on on uh, the King James, King Bible. James Bible, don't sell your vineyard. And all of a sudden, he's getting attacked <laughs> from this ministry about how wrong he is. And I'm just going, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought we was all on the same side here. And I found out that you can act conservative. Yes. And then despise privately the King James Version, oh, yeah. thinking that you're smarter than the Bible. So go ahead. Well, I just want to say to everybody listening while I've got the chance, because I've never been on a broadcast with you before. But, folks, when I preached that message at that conference, and I really didn't know hardly anybody there, uh, I, I gave an invitation or closed the service yeah. in a way that I would hardly ever do, but it's just the Lord just put it on my heart. Yeah. I mean, literally right at the end of the message that if you're not going to sell your vineyard, which I typified as the authorized King James Bible, the old Bible of America was founded on. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to sell it out, stand. And when I said that, this man here was the very first man that just shot up out of his seat. And it was kind of funny because during the message, he was really look, giving me the look over pretty hard. <laughs> I didn't know who he was. I had, <laughs> I had had it said. I mean, God, that was in 2000. It was in, in it, it was in 1998 when God came to me and said, "Mike, this Bible's right," and I accepted it like a like a person would accept salvation. I I did not argue with God. I immediately because I knew it was from the Holy Ghost. But God, there was still some questions in the back of my mind that I didn't have answered yet. Yeah. But I, I, I decided that, you know what, Mike, if you're down here and you're telling everybody you're King James, you're, I'm not going to sit here and wait to see who else stands up. <laughs> I'm going to stand up because that's I, what in, got me in my heart. I know it's right in my, see, that's the difference between your spirit and your flesh. Your spirit automatically just agrees with God, but your flesh is always going to try to, to jab at it a little bit. And I had questions then that I don't have now. Yeah. I have them answered now. But, but it was God just, wants you to go by faith. That's right. That's exactly what it was. And so believing what I, then figured out. That's right. That's <laughs> and what I was gonna say was what I as I began to listen to to his ministry, his preaching, not only is he teaching this young preacher that you have to say things that you know for a fact there's probably somebody sitting there looking you in the eye that they don't want you to say it and they don't want you to bring it up. And I've had deacons. I had a deacon here that I just knew the man was going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And I just, at some point, I'm going to have to sit down with him and say, uh, I'm going to preach against Hillary running in this election. And it, and that was in 08, First time what was the first time she ran in 08? And, I, and by then, God had run him out of the church. So I didn't have to deal with it. But not only am I learning that, but I'm also learning this. Mike, preach about your own sins first. Don't tell those people how good you are because you're not. And God fixed it in me long time ago. God crippled me in such a way is that I can never tell anybody how good I am. God crippled me like he did Jacob. He, I said, God mm-hmm. bless me, and he crippled me. And that was the blessing. Now I walk with a permanent limp, and I know what it is. And God will never, ever, ever, this side of heaven, let me get away with boasting. I can't do it. Not My, not, my bad conscience won't yeah. let me do it, because I know... What I am, and I want to tell you something, that right there, if you were to ask people, why do you listen to Mike Hoggard? Many of them will tell you he's honest about himself. He does not Mm -hmm. put himself up as Mr. Holy, Mr. Spiritual, because God taught me that the priest, 
when he's going to sacrifice for the people before he sacrificed for them. He had to sacrifice for his own sins. And I went, that's in the law? And that and God's smart. God's wise. God's know how to take us preachers, yeah. having the position that we are in, and humble us to such a point to where, if we're going to be honest, we're going to have to admit to our own families and our own people, we're not very righteous people. We're, we're pr- probably worse than they are. And we that makes us like the high priest that we have who knows the feeling of our infirmities. And I know what it's like for people to go through things. And there's things that you don't know. There's things that my own church doesn't know that I've gone through, and I won't say in the last maybe 10 years, that at some point I'm going to tell them I went through this and I know how some of you feel. And God allowed me to do that. There's no doubt in my mind God allowed me to do that. Because I now know how some pe- what some people deal with in their life. And to me, yeah, I have regrets. But when it comes to being able to minister to somebody, I'm, I can only comfort people with the comfort that I myself have been comforted yeah. with. Mike, I'll tell you, what you're saying there is so it ought to be taught to young preachers. Every Bible college ought to teach it, but they won't. Um, they won't, they won't because it's just part of the culture. Yeah. But the verse comes to my mind, God forbid that I should glory Amen. save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if, if we forget that all of our righteousness is the filthy rags, to be honest with you, Mike, I agree with you total. I've had more people say, Reggie, the thing that helps me is when you admit where you failed and how you sinned and yeah. how, you had, how, how God had to wrestle you around and whoop you to get you right with him about things. And then what that does is makes us fall upon his grace, upon his mercy, upon his cross, upon his redemptive work. And it becomes him and not us that gets the glory. Tell us about, along with this book, you have a CD that they can order extra mm-hmm. that um, I remember when you brought the idea to me that you were going to do this. So this this goes back several years oh, yeah. that you did these uh, character today studies. You meant for them to be like on a radio station. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I remember right, I think I've given these to Michael, my son-in-law, to be played in our two radio stations in Kenya. I have, I'm not sure if they've done that yet, yeah. but they're they're fantastic. And b- b- uh, before I forget, because I want to I want to drill you on some other issues before we get out of here. But <laughs> the there's we've already had. Uh, my daughter Lindsay called up and said, we've already had somebody call here and order 10 copies of the book. And that was in the first 30 minutes of us talking about it. Now, Christmas is coming. Okay. And and you you guys, I mean, my reputation is, you know me and you know, I, I want you to know him. He's honestly not doing this for the money. But I can tell you, we pay 30 cents for a DVD. That's why we can give them out all day long for free. Mm-hmm. But to get a book like this, he originally came to us first with publishing the book. And we started typing it up for him and getting it ready, getting it formatted and so on. But he, thank God he found a publisher because with the amount of books he's already sold, there's no way we're going to be able to keep up with it. And it's a, it's a, it's a, pretty good sized book but just by word of mouth this thing has already just taken off that's that's how you know it's from the lord because without any effort god's just sending this thing everywhere that's how you know it's from him is because he's doing the he's doing the promotion you're not and um so you go to the website tableinthewilderness.net you can order it directly from pastor kelly you, I showed you the Amazon link earlier. You can find it at Amazon.com, and uh, you can order from Amazon. You, if you order from Amazon Prime, if you're a Prime member like we are, uh, you order the book, you don't have to pay the shipping. Amazon pays the shipping because they got their hooks in the United States Postal Service. That's another story, but anyway, uh, but you can order it directly from there. And if you order it from uh, Pastor Kelly, you can also order this Character Today CD. It's got, uh, what, 50 different character studies on there they're about two or three let's just do something fun go ahead when i first put this book out about what was six i don't know five or six weeks ago when it was published 
I, the first hundred people that bought a book, I gave them a free CD of Character Today. Okay. And they're narrated, music-backed characters, 50 of them. They, they're about a minute apiece. It's the best thing in the world, drive down the road with your kids with, stuff yeah. like that. i tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I, we didn't plan this, but if they'll order today, and they'll go to uh, tableinthewilderness.net, and order now, uh, the reason I have to do that that way is because that's we'll have to send them. You can't get right. that over Amazon. Amazon doesn't have it. Okay, that, so but. if you go to tableinwilderness.net and you order a book today, walk to see with me. We'll send you a character today along with it. You free. can't beat that. Okay, that's a good uh, deal. They don't cost us much. That's right. I mean, far as now we those are those are old. I, I can reproduce them very cheaply. Yeah. Uh, but you are right. The book. Uh, Mike, I hate to say this, but if I'd have known what the book was going to cost, I probably would have chickened out. <laughs> That's a good thing I didn't know. I'm honest yeah. with you, you know. But it was very, very expensive. Now the next printing, we had a you know thousand books. Maybe we got the next printing. It won't be as bad. Yeah, but look, but, look uh, how big this is, though. Yeah, it, 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 it was expensive. I mean, it really was. And you know, uh, we just there's just there was a lot more to it than ever doing. Right. First, first book I've ever published. So I just you know I was waiting out in the creek and didn't know how deep the pool was. You right. Know? But that's okay. God has taken us through, and Amen. it's good shape. So, and we're fine. And and I would ask people to pray for me because you know I'm just kind of an old little country boy. And uh, when I when they published this book and they handed it to me, and I'm going, and that's sharp, and it's got my name up in the corner, and wow, I must be somebody now. And I've had a little pride trouble uh, uh, thinking, uh, boy, well look what I've done. And then mm -hmm. Lord's had to kind of rebuke me and say, oh, who really? did it? Yeah, who did it? <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Who gave you that idea? Who did yeah, the, what yeah. kind of what kind of scumbag are you anyway? Yeah. So while I've got you, we got about uh seventeen minutes left today. So I want to ask you some things that some things going on in the world right now. Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> okay. What is why why did they have to go all the way back to his high school and pull out something from his high school? Now you understand. When you are in high school, you are of a age of minority. They don't let you vote. They don't <laughs> let you sign contracts because you are still a minor child. You cannot determine where you're going to live when you're in high school because you are a minor child and the world regards you as not having, as Judge Duty says, you're not being, you're not done cooked yet. <laughs> you still need to go back in the oven. You're not done yet. So they go all the way back to this guy's childhood. When he was in third grade, he saw a girl's panties, and he shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. Tell me what you think about that. Your daughter, by the way, is a Missouri legislature. And there are insights into politics because you have a, your family has a politics background that I don't have. So give us your political perspective on Brett Kavanaugh. Should he be on the Supreme Court? Well, I believe he ought to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, he's Catholic in his uh, belief, but uh, we do have a constitution. And uh, we have a constitution. And uh, aside from that, I know some great Catholic people that are constitutional, that are conservative. Uh, many of your, many of the people that some of us would say we love to listen to are of Catholic faith. Uh, let me just say something about people of Catholic faith right now. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is in a huge upheaval. Absolutely. And it's in an upheaval because they have a history now that's coming out, and mm -hmm. I thank God it is, of the wretchedness and yeah. the wickedness and the sodomite culture that's within the Catholic Church. There's a lot of innocent Catholic people who just don't know, don't understand. They don't know the Bible. They're just following what they've been told and raised right. in. And we can sit here and condemn them, but if we've been raised in that, we, it'd, be, it'd be tough for us. Right. As far as a general person, I think he's a great person. Uh, I think uh, I think he's a constitutionalist. That's my main concern. Right. Uh, will he follow the Constitution and not try to make law? Will he uh, execute the laws that are and rule according to the law that is already written? And I think that's the biggest question about him. What has happened to him is, in effect, uh, the great warfare that we're on uh, between uh, socialism and uh, and uh, capitalism and, and American constitutionalism. But as far as let me, I've got a Facebook clip out on this. Yeah. And what I take off with is Joseph Potiphar's wife. Yeah. There's no situation you and I are going to deal with in culture, in the news or anything else politically that what we can go to the Bible and find. And the Bible says Absolutely. these things are written aforetime for your right. learning. Okay. So God says, I want you to learn from these things I've recorded. Well, what happened to Joseph? He was falsely accused. Right. By a woman. 
of sexual assault. Yep. Uh, another case in the Old Testament is... She had... Potiphar's wife actually had more evidence <laughs> yeah. than Brett Kavanaugh's accuser. Yeah. I think we're, this is a very serious time. I think that I think we're going to look back 30 years from now, if Jesus tarries, we're going to see this as a turning point in American history. And whether that our constitutional system was salvaged and retained or whether it was lost at this point. Because if he's not appointed to the Supreme Court at this point, we will have lost constitutional law yeah. in this country. It's just a matter of going ahead and falling off the cliff. Uh, if you go back to the Bible again as a basis, and this is where our, all of our determination of I- issues should come from, you have Jezebel, mm-hmm. who her husband wanted Naboth's vineyard, and she got it for him. Now, again, it's a woman. So what did she do? She goes and gets false witnesses, brings them up, makes false accusations, and Naboth is killed, his sons are killed, and they steal their land based upon a woman's false accusations. Exactly. Jesus Christ. Bingo. Totally, through his ministry. You, uh, he hath a devil. Yeah. Uh, you're not the son of God. Uh, you know, constantly being falsely accused. And then when he went to trial, just a barrage yeah. of false accusations. The apostle Paul. Yeah. Constantly being falsely accused. Yeah. And so if you're going to stand for anything in life, that's part of the test of your faith. It's part of the trial. It's the toughening. It's the, it's just the way God orchestrated it. And there's great value in it. He, Kavanaugh has been through the fire now. Now, let me tell you something. I expect he's going to be, con, he, I expect him to be confirmed. Okay. Mm-hmm. What do you think he's going to do with issues that the liberals are in favor of now? He's going to, he's going to stomp on them. He's going to, he's, he's now, <laughs> he's now fired up because he got criticized for how he spoke to the liberal Democrats on that committee, and they were just going, we have never been talked to this way before. That's terrible. But I'm going, finally, yeah. somebody who will tell Diane Frank Einstein that she's ugly, for crying out <laughs> loud. Somebody who will speak their mind, and, yeah. and you could see the, <laughs> the irritation in his face at the liberal Dems on that committee who were just trying to make stuff up, dragging his wife and family through the... Did you see the cartoon Yeah, yep, I've that seen they it. made of his daughter? Yep. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't believe the the depths. When the liberals talk about how caring they are wait and about minute, how, wait, how wait, wait. anti-violent they are... Mike, you said... But I know you know. I know you can believe because those people who are will butcher a baby in the mother's right. womb, there Absolutely. is nothing they will not do. Butchering a man's character is nothing to butchering a baby. That's exactly right. Butchering his children's uh, spiritual life yep. is nothing to butchering a baby. And so, uh, But let me tell you something, what's happening. They, he is going to have his conservative constitutional values set in hard concrete right. over this. Yeah. So if he's on the court... Uh, any sympathy that he might have had to look at their viewpoint. Never going to do it. It's over. Yeah. And so they did this to themselves. They did it to themselves when Hillary ran for president and the American people decided this lady scares us. And I've been in a union for all my life and I voted union Democrat, but there is no way in the world I'm voting for this Jezebel witch to be my president. And they came out of the woodwork yeah. and put Trump in office. And that's another thing, you know, you pray for our nation. I bet you everybody listening to me nearly prays for America. Yeah, I bet you love your country. I do. And you pray. Well, let me tell you this. I think that all of this that's happened in the hearings is very, very likely that it's going to work out for great good. And here's why. Did not the Kavanaugh issue arise this conservative vote? Right. Was it not said that the conservatives who voted for Trump were just kind of leth- lethargic and not too interested in the election? And the, and the Democrats and the liberals were all fired up to, to give uh, Trump a fatal blow. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something, dear friend, right now, across America, the red states are on fire. That's exactly right. And if they do, I think they'll have a vote later this week. Mm-hmm. If he is not confirmed by the Senate vote, that will be the super fire. They'll that lose will be the, the, nu- the nuclear explosion will happen on the ballot box. Yeah, they will lose the election. Trump will turn around, renominate him, and it will be used as an issue clear through the election. Absolutely. Senate, the Republicans will hold the Senate, yeah. probably hold the House, and he will be confirmed, and they will be in worse shape than they've ever been. Now, that's my prayer. I like it. But I see the pathway to that. Even if he's not going to, now, if he's confirmed, you know, this week, so be it. We move on down the road. But if he's not confirmed, let me tell you something. The the hotbed, 
You know, Mike, I'm going to be honest with you, and I think everyone listening, we are not that. There's a strong possibility of a hot war in this country. I believe it. We're in a hot cultural, spiritual warfare now. It's yeah. on. It, the fire, it's on. The fire is cooking. And and yeah. if Amphita and the liberals have their way, I mean, what's Maxine Waters saying? Yeah. Go out and harass them, harass them. Well, you know what you're going to do? You're going to run into some people that's not going to be as gracious as Ted Cruz was. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to fire back, literally. And, I mean, it's going it, to – something's – if you just look at history, yeah. there's always a trigger point. When something sets it off, and I don't know, I, I hope and pray we don't because it's a terrible thing, but the liberals will never be satisfied without power. And so if they can't have power politically, they will do what socialists and communists have always done. They will move to take power physically and militarily. All right, I got another one for you. Get ready. Brace yourself. <laughs> Everybody get ready. Pastor Kelly, is the earth flat? <laughs> Am I a Democrat? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not flat. I have. And to uh, me, it's a stupid subject. It is. It is. But let me tell you, I've been watching. I've been watching. You know, I I have this Facebook meme. You know, those pictures they put up on Facebook all the time. It's this little girl squinting <laughs> like this, and it says. I don't always watch flat earth videos, but when I do, I squint. <laughs> I do. I listen to what they say and their reasoning for saying it. And I just shake my head and I'm going, how can somebody lose their mind so, so far? that they would actually believe this. And here's it, it. If it was just, I've been waiting for this thing to die down and it hasn't, it's grown. <laughs> they had their first international conference where people came in from miles. They all flew on airplanes to get there over, over the globe <laughs> and they had a conference. And now there are, there are Hollywood a listers that are taking this seriously now. There are basketball players that are coming out saying, I believe the earth is flat. And of course, but here's what bothers me about it. And it really gets me. I, I'm like David. I hate every false way, especially when they include God in it. Now, if somebody wants to lie about some stupid thing that has no relevance to the Bible whatsoever, I don't care. But, and I've said this, if, if somebody says, well, I've seen a few Flat Earth videos and they've got some things I can't answer and, I, you know, maybe it is, I don't know, but I really don't care. I'm just going to read the Bible and try to witness the people and try to live my life. I'm fine with you, okay? But most of the pushers of this Flat Earth idea, they've hijacked creationism. In other words, if you say that you believe in biblical creation, you must believe that the earth is flat or you don't really believe it. They have hijacked um they've hijacked Bible believing in general. And I am if you ask me, Pastor Mike, do you believe every word in the King James Bible? Why don't I? I absolutely believe every word there. Do I have a full comprehension of everything the Bible says? No, neither did Peter. Peter said Paul's things are hard to understand, and yet, you know, hey, he said, read Paul. I don't quite understand. I'm learning more every day, but I don't understand everything the Bible says, but I believe everything the Bible says. And one of the things that I absolutely know beyond any shadow of a doubt is that if the flat earth agenda had two verses in the Bible that both agreed that the earth was flat, I would believe it. I would believe it against everything that I know. I would believe it because out of the mouth of two witnesses. But the problem is that it's not there. And what they have done is that they use extrapolations and opinions about verses in the Bible to make the earth flat. Oh. And then they say, they say to me, Hoggard, and because I've read the Facebook comments and I've read the YouTube comments, Hoggard is a Satanist, if he wants to believe Satan's lies, well, then go right on. Well, you know what? That is offensive, not only to me, but I am offended that they would say that about people in your church and my church 
who know nothing but Christ crucified, and they know the Bible, and they believe it, and they wouldn't give, they would not walk across the yard to hear somebody talk about flat earth because it doesn't matter to them. But these people are accusing them of not believing God. Thence, they're accusing them of not even being saved by saying, you believe Satan's lies. That, to me, is an offense. And I, the people who don't believe it, who can't articulate it, I have a mouth and I have a, a means to say things that other people want said. And I think that it's at least my responsibility to come out and say, this is a lie. They are deceiving people. It is an issue that is distracting. I like what you said to me at lunch, which was about, they'll talk all day about the flat earth, but... When's the last time they talked to somebody about their soul? Absolutely. When's the last time they gave the gospel to a lost man? They will sit and produce flat earth videos. They'll get on, they'll, they'll cruise Facebook posts just looking for someone to speak against it. Because they will inject themselves into the comment section and they spend all day long doing this claiming, you know, the Bible says knowledge puffeth up. And these people have an, have a knowledge that they feel makes them superior to everybody else in the world. And whereas five years ago, they would have never picked up a Bible. Now, all of a sudden, they're Bible experts. Because they know the earth is flat, and they know that everybody else, including me, is lying about it. It reminds me of the Athenians. Right. They did nothing but to hear or tell some new thing. And, Mike, I there's just a lot of things I'm not interested in. I don't have time, and I'm not inclined that way. And there's, there's, there's not to say that some things aren't important. Right. But I have to make up my mind uh, what issues are worth. You, you what, pick your fights well. I pick my fights. And, yeah. And, uh, I wouldn't give two cents to discuss with anybody. I I don't tend to waste three seconds of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, you're in a different ministry, and you have a the Lord's giving you a different aspect, and 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 somebody does need to counter all this stuff. But I would just challenge them to say this: Hey, why don't you spend the next six weeks, bingo, trying to win lost souls to Christ, trying to stand against the sin and the wickedness of this nation, instead of getting off on some ludicrous it's a distract it's a deliberate distraction. distraction and i would say to them that satan is laughing his backside off yep. at the distraction he's got them into and then to, to attack fellow christians if there are christians to start with. why don't you go fight the other enemy why do you want to shoot and kill your own wounded or your own fellow soldiers yeah i don't understand that and so i would just say i don't want anything to do with it i don't care who's listening don't matter you need, you need to get off that trail. Amen. You're messed up. I mean, I, if that makes you mad, I can't help it too bad. I've had a lot worse than you to deal with. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying it's, it's, it's just, you know. Yeah. And I don't want to be mad at them. I'm not going to be mad at them. But it's just ludicrous. Yeah. You know, it's just it's, it's like a lot of other issues. You know, Satan is, I, I've got a theory of life. I'm, I'm walking down the road of my life trying my best to answer the do the will of God that he's called me to do. Now, every once in a while, Mike, I go by a driveway, and here comes this pit bull or a chihuahua or a German shepherd out barking his stinking head off at me. And you know what Satan wants me to do is turn around and chase that dog back down the the, the driveway mm-hmm. and spend half the day hollering and throwing rocks at that dog. Right. Well, what's happened to me? Right. I could have been another mile down the road yeah. having gotten something done for God, but now what am I doing? I'm down the driveway throwing rocks and hollering and kicking at a dog. Right. So I've just decided, yeah, if I have to, I'll kick the chihuahua. <laughs> but I'm just, but I'm going to walk on. But I'm pretty moving soon, on. Yeah. Pretty soon he'll go back to his driveway. Yeah. And I'm going to go on with the cross, the blood, the resurrection, the new birth. Yeah. I'm telling you, you know, and uh, <laughs> I just... Uh, I don't like those distractions. Pastor, God has done a wonderful thing uh, in your life. Uh, I could not have written this book because it bas- it's come out of your life, your background, your heart. God, for better or for worse, God led you down all the roads that he led you down so that he could bring this about. And I'm excited to see what God's going to do with it in the future. And uh, you heard it here. He's already, there's already a sequel in his mind 
to this, but before you read the sequel, you got to read this. Tableinthewilderness.net, go to Amazon.com. But if you go to Table in the Wilderness today, you get the book and the CD as well. God bless you, Pastor Green. Thank you so much. Thank Love you. Ya. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. It's been a real joy. It has been a joy. Hey, everybody, think Bible. <laughs>